Thank you for joining us. Come have a seat at the table, we're just about to begin. As always, I'm Dia McGarren, joined once again by our cast of wonderful and affordable role players. Our last game, we were introduced to the heroes of Theros in their darkest hour. Our heroes had journeyed to the polis of Melithus after receiving omens of a great cataclysm. As we enter the harbor, they were just in time to see the arrival of the Bane of Humanity, an Archon. The battle led up to the Pyrus at the foot of the statue of Ophira. During the battle, the citizens prayed for their god to come save them, and so come she did. The moment Ephira appeared, the battle seemed to turn in the hero's favor. That is, until the Archon speared the god through the heart. With the god of the Polis dying, a bolt of lightning strikes our heroes. Now we continue the story as the champions wake up on a strange beach in an unknown land. So, let's begin as the Sunday Nights present for your listening pleasure part 2 of Heroes of Theros, Godfall. <laughs> He just laying there looks around and realizes he's in the sand yeah. and immediately pushes his arms upward and looks around, looks to the left, looks to the right, and examines his surrounding. To your left and to your right, you see dark spiny rocks spearing out of the sand. As you look forward, you see a, um, a dark sea spread beyond you, or spread before you. Um, can I do a nature check and see if I can figure out, like, what kind of rocks these are? Are they, like, obsidian? Or... Anyways. Uh, sure, go ahead, roll. That's gonna be a 15? They're not obsidian. Okay. The stones that surround you are slate, or made of slate. They're no close. Anybody do anything else? Ragnar will look off into the horizon, uh, sees the sea and, and, and uh, stones, uh, and looking for any type of uh, civilization off in the horizon. So off in the horizon is just the water and the seas. As you look behind you, Ragnar, you see a wide expanse of greenery and forestry. You also, behind you, you see the peaks of what looks to be buildings. You can safely assume a small village or some type of town is beyond the forest. So question, when Klaus is looking to the left and right of him, Mm -hmm. Are, am I seeing the other people around me? Yes, you are all together on the same beach. Okay. Is everyone, I assume everyone's awake at this point? Yes, everyone Everyone is awake at this point. Okay. So, Klaus would then look at these people who he's only seen when fighting this, this last, this last creature. And he would look directly at each of them and, and state to the general populace, Who are you? Uh, Ragnar uh, speaks up. I'm Ragnar. I am a follower of Coronus. I was last in the city, and I don't remember anything, saw a white light, and now I find myself here on this beach. I am praying to my god for another omen. I'm here as well. I am Tyrex, <clears throat> champion of Morgus. He'll stomp angrily while brushing dirt out of his uh, out of his pelt, start pacing back and forth in the surf. Do you have any idea how we got here? Archon Cowards uses his magic to send me away before I could deliver his end. Well, Ragnar is behind him says, and what a mighty end it will be. <laughs> well, it seems the fault of on them for uh, putting you with myself. So, what do you guys do? First off, I would like to know, are we still damaged from the previous fight? Are we healed up when we come on the beach? Or ha- what condition are we in? You are fresh from the fight. Your body is definitely beaten up from the battle that you just had. Lopos is looking very worse for wear. <laughs> So are we still uh, damaged or are we f- full health at this point? I'm going to speak damaged. up and say we should rest here for the night. We can defend and we have the, the sea at our sides to make sure that nothing attacks us. So we can do shifts of watch and uh, rest up here. I think I would agree with you on that. And I would like to learn more about these uh, you all who, who are with me. Very well. Ragnar would suggest that while we rest, that we set up a ritual, pray to our deities for aid, and to give us an omen of what is to lie ahead of us, so that they can give us a clear path to guidance. Mogus answers in bloodshed, and Tyrexon will pull some blood from a wound and throw it kind of down to the dirt and just stare at it. I'm not actually expecting that to do anything, but... Right. Klaus will uh, see you do this and... and kind of raise an eyebrow and go, oh, all right. There has been much bloodshed today. Mogus may answer elsewhere. And to save face, I'll kind of go start gathering wood for a fire. What are you doing? The the broken bow of Nyla 
rest still in your hands. I'm just kind of astonished um, that I had failed so badly. I need to get revenge or find a way to fix this or, or something. I, I don't know how to move forward, but I know that wrong has happened and I must fix this some way or somehow. Okay, Ragnar? Uh, Ragnar will assist in gathering wood and for fire and prepare uh, like a little stone uh, bowl for a ritual to be cast once we have a fire going. <laughs> Tyrexon will make a move to reach for the broken bow to add to his wood pile. I growl in your direction. <clears throat> Tyrex will give a low growl and as if answering a challenge and just kind of wave it off like not worth it. You're Leonine, right? Yes. So Tyrexon will come back with a heaping pile of firewood. You guys put it together. Who lights the firewood and how do you do it? I have a tinderbox. I will come up to the fire and I am just going to light uh, below it and just get it going. Okay. I didn't know if anybody had like magical means to light a fire. But I am going to cut off a tuft of my fur to mm -hmm. use it as kindling. Very nice. So Lopos, you cut off the tuft of your fur from your mane and you drift into the fire. As it hits the fire, the fire crackles and turns bright green for a split second and then dies back into a calming warm orange. I smell failure. Oh damn. The sun starts its descent into the western sky. Helios will finish pulling his chariot as night takes over. Outside of your fire, it is pitch black. There's not many sources of light. The stars themselves seem to be away from this place. You've never been to this beach before? This entire area is unfamiliar to you. So, how do you guys spend your night? I'll take uh, mid-watch. Mm -hmm. Ragnar, you said you wanted to do a ritual? Yes. Um, it's in my background. It's a shelter of the faithful. I can perform a religious ceremony of your deity. You and your adventurers, companions can expect to see receive free healing and care at a temple, shrine, or other established presence of your faith. The only thing that uh, Klaus would have is a, is a symbol that he has created and as a pendant on his neck. So would that be what it would derive from for him? Yes. Okay. Right. Is anybody doing anything that night? I I mean, for Klaus at least, I, I would he would uh, try to take a few pieces of the slate and, mm -hmm. and try to make a, a cleaner bed for himself to lay on. So, like, the slate is like rock. Well, are there any looser, smaller sections I mean, of it that might break off? There are sections of it that have broken off, but they're kind of jagged. Would not be very comfortable for a bed. All right, yeah, and what we're doing is I'm basically doing what's called a century's rest as part of my uh, anvil rock characteristics, which basically means that when I take a long rest, you must spend at least six hours in an, in, in an inactive, motionless state rather than sleeping. In this state, you appear inert, but doesn't render you unconscious, and you can see and hear as normal. You take through your century rest. Klaus tries to, he tries to find a bed as comfortable as possible. Tyraxun and Lopos kind of have a snarling match against each other. Anybody else do anything for the rest of the night? Uh, nope. Watches. Okay. As the night drags on, you're not accosted by anything. The night is very peaceful, though very, very quiet. The only sound that you can really hear is the sound of the crashing waves upon the beach. You hear no bird calls, you hear no animals hunting at night. The silence itself could be near deafening. You're all able to get a pretty good rest throughout the night, so you guys can go ahead and fully heal yourselves. Ragnar, as you prepare your ritual, you get no answer back. Though, once the sun rises in the eastern sky, a loud thunder crack echoes throughout the entire area, rousing everybody from their slumber. Ah, uh, Kronos, he speaks to me. And by gods, what does he say? Do tell him to keep it down. I shall focus more and see, and see what omens he presents me now. As you look up to the sky, the clouds themselves are clear and the sky is bright. There are no storm clouds. The thunder sound didn't seem to come from anywhere nearby. Uh, does it seem like it came from the village area? Maybe in that direction? Nope. It was just a loud thunder clap. We don't have any direction that it might be from? Not that, Not you, that know. you know. I, I'm going to try this just because I can, and if it, if it works, it works. If it don't, it don't. Sure. Uh, as an action, I'm going to request your, your, I'm doing it in a divine intervention. As an action, request your deity's aid and roll percentile dice. If the number rolled is equal to or less than your cleric level, your deity intervenes. And if I fail, then I don't, I can't do it again for another seven days. Okay. Roll percentiles. Woo. Oh my. <laughs> Missed it by one. Ragnar, as you're focusing on your god, the wind starts to pick up. You can smell the ozone in the air. Your blood starts to boil. Your god is about to answer your prayers. And then everything dies down suddenly. Well, it was worth a shot. 
<laughs> that was really close. That was super close. I love those. It's all I could do, and I'm just happy that I rolled that low. Yeah, that was awesome. Maybe it was just gas. Uh, so lots of times, the Pronos he answers other moments in other ways, uh, but uh, I was unable to get a clear answer this time. You have the ocean to your front and civilization to your back. Ragnar would suggest that maybe we approach the village, see if we can find any signs or, or omens from the village and uh, will help or aid us. I concur. A nice uh, town with some some other beings might be a good change here. As you all turn and head towards the forest that leads to the village, you guys see a small path that's been cut through the forest. So the path that leads through the bush is a little bit more than a game trail. It takes you about 15 minutes to walk through the forest itself. Again, you hear no sounds of animals. You don't hear any crickets, no birds, no anything. The only thing that you can hear is the crunching of leaves under your feet. Are we and dead? No spoilers. As you make your way out of the forest into the town, as you're looking around, you see that the buildings are cracked and been in disuse. You don't see any people. It looks like this place has been abandoned for years. But you do start to hear something. Go ahead and make me a perception check. That's going to be a 12 from Lopo. Okay. 15 from Klaus. 16 from Tyraxum. And Ragnar? A Ragnar rolled a 6. Okay. Lopos and Ragnar, you hear something, but you're not exactly sure what it is and what's, or which direction it's going in, it's coming from. Tyrax and Klaus, it sounds very similar to like dice inside of a clay cup rattling around, and it's coming from further into the town, directly ahead of you. Klaus will uh, walk on in that direction. Okay. What are the rest of you doing? I will follow behind my companions, because uh, apparently they know better than I do which direction to go. All these people seem to want to cause pain to the guy that uh, did this to us, so mm-hmm. yeah, I'm following with them. Power in numbers, enemy and my enemy. As you guys walk through the center of the town, the rattling gets louder, and you come across what you assume to be the town square. You see a fountain in the center square, lined by cracked and desolate buildings. Sitting on the edge of the fountain is a woman, seems to be elderly, wrapped in rags, and she's just playing with a cup, and she looks up at you. Ah, uh, yeah, to have the bones cast for you? Yes. I turn to my companions, and I, I say, I suppose, look, give them an odd look as he points over to this woman at the at the fountain. fountain. I'd like to know if I could do a religion check on the woman, see if she's a holy woman or maybe she's a medicine woman. Sure, go ahead. Uh, nope, 11. You're not really getting anything from her. Uh, casting of the bones sounds very familiar. It sounds something similar to an augury, like fortune telling. I asked the woman, are you a soothsayer? Are you a seer? Fortune teller, perhaps? Klaus is not familiar with these peasant ways, so he, he assumes that his companions know better than he about this. She rattles the cup again. Yes, that's uh, that's close enough. She continues to rattle it. Care to have the bones cast? I would like to aid you in the matter, if I could, to help get a correct reading from the bones. Very good. Come here. Come here. I'll approach. Very intimidating. Klaus will observe. Tyrex will stand back, muttering something about witchcraft. So Ragnar, as you walk over to her, and she'll hold out the cup and just jiggle it in front of you. All right, so I'll put my hand above the cup, wiggling my fingers with, with as, as I've been kept, as I've been pretending, as like I'm trying to do a ritual with my hands and so that I get a spark of energy similar to what I did in the temple to cast onto the stone to provide an appropriate answer from Coronas. As you're waving your hands back and forth, she will take her other hand and then she will put it on top of your hand and then push your hand on top of the cup so you're sealing it and she'll actually flip the cup over onto your hand itself so the bones touch your skin. Now go ahead, throw the bones, and let's see what they say. Is she sitting on something? Like it's something I can just push the roll of she, stones against? Uh, she's sitting on the fountain, so she's sitting on the ring of the fountain. All right, I will uh, roll the bones close to the ground against the, the, the fountain so that it hits the, the stone of the fountain to make them kind of like dice roll off and bounce off of the fountain. See what we get. So what comes out of the cup is not dice, it is bones. Anybody want to do a medicine check? I can do it. Go ahead. Klaus got 13. Uh, I rolled a 10. You kind of understand that, that these are some type of humanoid bones. As they clutter against the cobblestones, you can see blue veins wrapped around them, making symbols. As the bones hit the ground, the symbols on top start to glow a little bit, and she looks down. Ooh, my, my, my. Uh, and as she kind of glances down at the, at the bones after I cast them, she'll see like a little bit of a static electricity off the bones, and then it would fade away into the ground. 
You have done many great deeds. For Karanos, a champion, you have faced many calamities. He was wise to choose you, but I fear that you are not prepared for what is to come. I asked the woman, so how may I prepare? What do I need to do? How should I pray to Karanos to have him give me the strength to proceed forward? Well, first, you must understand that what is at stake. All I know is that there's a great calamity coming upon the world and that he has given me an omen that this must calamity must be stopped and it must be give me the strength. <laughs> you are one track mind and always have been, Ragnar. Piranus has always put me on this path, has always given me the guidance to push forward, to get through any foe, to make sure that we right the wrath that has been brought upon us and set free the world and so that Karanus can provide it with his ultimate judgment. Yes, but I feel that his judgment is not up to par anymore. And she'll reach into her rags and she will pull out a piece of cloth. The cloth itself is frayed at the end. Tassels of thread and fabric hang loosely from it. And the cloth itself seems to be, pieces of it seem to be woven together, braided together. Some pieces seem frayed. There are holes inside the cloth itself. And she holds it out to you. Tell me what you see, Ragnar. Hmm, let me see. I close my eyes. I focus a little bit more on Karanus. And I open up my eyes, speak a few words, and see if I can see any type of meaning coming off the cloth. Roll an insight? Uh, 15. The way that the fabric is bound together, woven together, it's very chaotic, but there's an order to it. There seems to be a purpose for every single knot, every single twist, every single loop. It's a prime example of ordered chaos. That's right up Ragnar's tree because he's uh, chaotic neutral. Mm -hmm. The woman will look away from Ragnar and will look at you, Klaus. A lot of people have it wrong. People think that fate is a loom, a perfectly ordered and balanced tapestry that is just being woven. But fate is not that way. It is messy. It is chaotic. And some pieces of threads are way more important than others. And from her hand, she will produce a needle. The needle itself is pure black, twisted and jagged. And she'll take the needle and she will dig into the piece of cloth and pluck out a single thread. The thread itself is golden with flecks of blue. And then she'll hand you the rest of the cloth, Ragnar. Hold it in your hand and tell me what happens. All right, I'll hold it in my hand and watch, see what happens. As you hold it in your hand, the braids start to come undone, the knots start to loosen. After a few seconds, you're just holding a bundle of thread and loose fabric. That is what you're facing. That is what happens when a god dies. And she gestures her hands around. This place, something very similar happened all those years ago. Malefus will fall unless the Archon can be stopped. And the, the old woman will stand up. She'll straighten her back, and she starts to remove the pieces of cloth. And as she does that, her body starts to grow. And soon, she's towering over you, Ragnar. Ten feet tall, fifteen, twenty feet. Until finally, Clothis, the god of destiny, stands before you. Each thread that hangs off her horns is a thread of destiny. And she looks down upon you, champions. That is the fate that it will become this world. We gods have put our faith in you, champions. Do you answer our call? Yes, of course, Clothus. I'll do my best. I kind of sucked the last time I did this, though. So Clothus sees this transformation and instantly pushes himself up towards her and, and bows before her and says, Clothus, my goddess, you have chosen me as your champion. I will not let you down. Of course. But know that, that. that you walk upon a very fine, thin thread. Failure this time will mean the end of the age of gods and the beginning of the age of tyranny but you must ask for our favor and to do this you must go through the ordeal do you understand champions me well ragnar will speak to Kronos. is the only god that gives me my fate but if your fate is tied with his and this is a direction that we must go to repair what has been broken amongst the gods then so be it how dare you be so blasphemous before her Tyrex will be disappointed that his god did not appear, but he'll kind of just nod, grunt. To first, to take on the ordeal, you must journey to the Nyx itself. There are not many places upon this world in which you can do that. However, you are fortunate. Fate has smiled upon you. This island has one such place. You must go to the shrine of Nithos, 
But to do that, you must get help. There is an evil on this island that prevents your entrance to the Nyx. A giant of slaughter and death. <laughs> yes, I am. Oh. Defeat this giant, and the path before you will be opened. It will be a good hunt. We shall do whatever needs to be done, my, my goddess. I have faith in you, Klaus. I have oh. faith in all of you. But do not fail us. If you reach the Nyx, then we will greet you with open arms. But we will also greet you with your greatest of challenges. And then she will disappear. As she disappears, Klaus will stand upright and look upon his companions and say, You see, my goddess has helped us bring us here. We should go where she leads us. No, your goddess merely pointed her finger and you leapt like a, a bitch in heat. I don't and see yours anywhere. He's too busy to appear. Ragnar, Lopos? Ragnar uh, says, uh, as long as uh, Karanus this drives me, and I believe that our fates are intertwined, that this is the, the best solution possible to battle the cataclysm that has come before us. I shall follow. Yeah, and don't take what this cow has to say to heart. As close as this appears, directly behind her, you notice one of the buildings has been completely destroyed. It's just ruins. As you look upon it, you see scorch marks and you see cracking. Some type of devastation has happened to this building. All the other ones are desolate and cracked, but this one has completely been destroyed and, and demolished. Okay, so essentially as soon as she leaves, we, we all kind of see this from behind her? Yes. Okay, so Klaus and his his goddess high, he's, he's sitting here goes, that building, there must be something there. Come look! And runs over and goes to examine it. Okay. What are the rest of you doing? Well, that explains the lightning. Ah, very true. Maybe uh, Karanus has sent us an omen. As you guys head to the building, it has been completely destroyed. Scorch marks surround the columns that have not been entirely decimated. And in the center of the building, you see a giant footprint. It's been scorched into the ground. Is this footprint? Is it just one footprint or other footprints? Is there anywhere else that this... Does it go away from us in a direction? It's a, it's a singular footprint leading away from the town. Go forward and see if we can find any other footprints. Sure. Lopus, go ahead and roll me a survival check. And the rest of you can roll investigation. That's going to be a 7. Ragnar rolled an 11. Okay. Tyraxon investigated with a 15. So Klaus investigated with a 3. He's uh, very gently attempting to pick things up. So, Klaus, as you're carefully examining the area, ignoring the footprint, Lopos, you've just been out of sorts ever since the bow has been broken. Your heart's not really into it. Ragnar is spending his time investigating the sky to see if it, there's any more omens. But Tyrax, you being part of the wilds, um, you're like, oh, there's the tracks. You see the tracks leading to a small valley that leads away from the town. By the size of the footprints, Tyrax, you're assuming that this creature probably stands close to two stories tall. Finally. A challenge, and I'll go stomping off in that direction, snorting wildly. All right, so Tyrex gives out his small little battle cry, leaving Ragnar, Klaus, and Lopos to their devices. Uh, if he's tramping off in a direction that seems to know where he's going, I will. I shall follow uh, Tyrex. Ugh! All right, so the two Minotaurs head off. Klaus, Lopos, what are you two up to? He's looking through, and, and he's he doesn't really know how to look for things in a messed up area, so he's sees them go off, and he takes the excuse and goes, uh, uh yes, I, I think we should go that way also, and goes and follows them. Using the tracking of Tyrex, you guys head into a valley. Everywhere that this path leads, you see nothing but destruction. Trees have rotted and withered away and broken down. It's just a path of destruction, rot, and death. The closer you get to the valley, bones start to litter the ground. You see humans, you see minotaur satyrs, it seems almost like a battle took place in this area. The valley gets narrower and narrower, and as you look into the distance, you can see a massive creature walking back and forth along the valley, pacing himself. You said there are minotaurs around here? Minotaur bones. What do you do? At the sight of uh, the bones, as I see that there are minotaur remains here, I, I become very, very irate and, and, and angry, and I speak to Tyrax. Ugh! I say, ugh, this is... This is by far, he has destroyed our people. I cannot wait for us to get into battle. These are not my people. They were weak. Mogus guides my hand. And Cronus shall support it. So I would like to do a survival check and check the bones. What are you checking for? Maybe 
cause of death. Uh, if I see like uh, if they were like stabbed through the chest, the the chest piece would be like broken, or if they were like pretty much intact, that would mean that they like died other means. So pretty much, I'm trying to figure out like cause of death. Blunt force trauma. Uh, would you roll for survival? Uh, critical twenty, uh, making it twenty five. Okay, so you roll a 25. You start to pick up the bones, and as you pick up the bones, they start to crack and break off in your hand. The bones themselves are very brittle, but it doesn't seem like they're that old. They're not bleached black. They seem to be kind of gray and ashen as you're looking at it. Some of them have been smashed and trampled, but a lot of them look like they just withered away and died. These Minotaur were not killed by normal weapons. I say that to the group. Okay. What are the rest of you doing? I am following Tyrex. <clears throat> So you see this creature walking back and forth through the valley, standing nearly two stories tall. So his skin seems ashen, and you see the nicks, divot parts of his body. Skulls and bones hang about his flesh, almost like a suit of armor. His eyes are sunken in, and you can see two globes of white. He doesn't seem to notice you guys at the moment. He's just walking back and forth through this valley. Around him, you see stone hands litter the ground and massive metallic swords. Everything else around it seems to be broken and destroyed. How far away are we from him right now? Uh, about uh, 70 feet. All right. Um, I would like to know if I could cast a spell. Okay. And I just turned my comrades and say, a Karatha shall shield his vision, shield us from his vision. And I'm going to cast a fog cloud, actually, as we when we get closer to him. I can do it out to 120 feet. I would also like to do my hunter's sense while he's doing that. And what is what hunter's sense? At third level, I gain the ability to peer at a creature and magically discern how best to hurt it. As an action, choose one creature you can see within 60 feet of you. You can immediately learn whether creature has any damage immunities, resistances, or vulnerabilities, and what they are. If the creature is hidden from divination magic, you sense that it has no damage immunity, resistances, or vulnerabilities. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your wisdom modifier, uh, minimum of one. You regain all expendable uses of it when you finish a long rest. And it doesn't require any save or anything. Oh, okay. So damage immunities, it is necrotic and poison, is its damage or immunities, and it has magic resistance. I suggest we take this thing on old school style, I say to the rest of the group. All right, so I would like to place <clears throat> a fog cloud at least uh, 20 feet from these rocks right here. Okay. okay. That's, so that's good. I'm going to put my fog cloud just in front of this. It's a 20 foot, it's basically a 20 foot uh, cube around this area. So um, that way we can use it to kind of conceal ourselves and get closer to these rocks so we can get a closer advantage on this giant. And he can't, hopefully he won't be able to see us as we try to close in. So go ahead and describe to me exactly how the spell works. I, as I, I tell my companions, I, I shall have call upon Kronos to obscure our movement so that we can get closer to our foe. And I start to concentrate onto the spell. As I start to, as I start to concentrate, uh, a fog like substance starts coming out of my nose and going into the ground and kind of just starts to move into the area of where the uh, area defected is uh, that I want it to go. Can I not see through that? It's fog. You can, yeah, no one can see through the fog. It obscures everybody. Cool. Uh, this will allow us to get okay, closer to our foe and then we can just use it to uh, surprise him. Once we get ourselves in position, I can always drop the fog cloud. This is just to, just to help us get closer so he doesn't see us sneaking up on him or see us as we're trying to go through. So this. I won't keep it up the whole time. It's just trying to get us into position where we can try to, so we can see him, or he can't see us, but we can see him, and then I'll drop the fog cloud. So is that where everybody's at? The giant has not noticed you yet. So Ragnar causes the fog, which obscures the area. So the fog blooms out into that area. The giant will turn around to see the fog, and because of the line of sight of Ragnar, he'll actually notice you. Uh, I'm on the edge of it, but okay. So what do you do? He notices a minotaur. I'm going to move into the fog cloud. I got have enough movement to get up into the cloud so that he can't see me. And I will trade places. Okay. All right, so if that's what everybody's doing, why don't we go ahead and roll for initiative? Low post is going to be 10. Uh, Ragnar rolls an 18. Tyraz um, is going at 19. Class is like, nah. <laughs> I'm not really feeling this whole giant thing. <laughs> Giants are for peasants. That's right. I will stand back and let the uh, the Menetzars deal with this. You put up the fall clad for a reason if you guys wanted to hide into that. Okay, so Tazrung, uh, you are up first. I will begin by Mooten taking a standard move, which is 40 feet, because mm -hmm. I'm a minotaur, and raging. Okay. I will then hold my action for whenever he gets within range. All right. Ragnar, you're up. I, I'm going to move up here to in front of this rock in the fog, 
And then I'm going to do a bonus action and cast Shield of Faith on myself. All right. Shield of Faith? Yep. So that makes my armor class a 21. All right. Anything for your action? Hold my action for right now. And, and I'm going to keep this fog cloud, this fog cloud up until people can get up into here and scare themselves. Next up is Lopos. All right. So I am going to head 45 feet uh, west. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to shoot my longbow. Fire away. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to cast Hunter's Mark. Okay, bonus action, Hunter's Mark. So you're going to cast Hunter's Mark upon the giant? Uh, yeah, uh, and then I am going to shoot him with my longbow. All right, roll for attack. So does a 24 hit? Yep, 24 will hit. All right, that's going to be three piercing damage. And then I am going to shoot again. Does a 22 hit? 22 will hit. And that's going to be uh, another seven piercing damage. Okay, sounds good. Roll 2d6. Six. So he will take six extra points from the hunter's mark. All right, it is the giant's turn. As the bolt hits the giant in the chest, you start to see bones start to crack and fall away from him. He looks up and looks directly at you, Lopos, and he will charge ahead. He's going to use his full movement to basically rush at you. He's, ignore- <laughs> he's, going, to- he's going to head and ignore the minotaur is not a threat. I will use my ready to action. Uh mm-hmm to do an attack action, giving me two attacks with my Great Axe. Mm -hmm. I will use Great Weapon Mastery to take five off my to hit rolls and add 10 to my damage rolls. Okay. And I will attack recklessly, giving me advantage on my attack rolls. All right, go ahead, swing. Come on, Mogus. Okay, so 18 and 13, oh. Okay, so is the 18 and the 13, is that minus the five or no? No, it is not. So I will whiff both times. So as the giant's passing you, you go, ha, ha, and you miss entirely with a 13 and a 8. And so, of course, you're not a threat to him. Of course, he's going to move on. But Ragnar, that also triggers your action. Perfect. Uh, so as he comes into my area, I'm going to actually try to use an action here to hit him with my horns. Now, do you have to be moving to do that? I uh, know, I'm using my uh, hammering horns, which basically your horns are natural metal weapons. You can use them to make an unarmed strike. If you hit with them, you deal piercing damage, 1d6 plus two, instead of bludgeoning damage normal for an unarmed strike. Hey, Ragnar, roll for attack. I rolled a 20. 20 will hit, go ahead, roll for damage. I rolled the damage before I rolled the hit, so I'm basically doing four points of damage to him as he comes by with my horns. Okay. As you grow your horns, you basically you scrape his leg. It's enough to hurt him, but not enough to get his attention. He's going to keep just running through and heading towards Lobos. Klaus, you are inside the heavy fog. You see a giant footstep cut through the fog a little bit and then walk away. And you hear the thunder, the boom, boom, boom as he's charging somebody. You don't see anything else in the fog, but you do hear the sounds of a roaring giant and the start of battle. Okay, so I cannot see him. No, you cannot see him. Ugh. All right, well, that messes up one of my actions. Klaus, you still can't see. Cool. Uh, can I... Yeah, I'm thinking I could move out of the fog area and to where I can... Just to where I can see him, so I imagine they'd be about right here outside of the circle. As you move out, you see the giant's back towards you. He has his fist raised about to slam upon Lopos. Okay, so I want to cast command on him, which will allow me to speak a one-word command. Mm-hmm. And I want to command halt. Go ahead and describe what you do. Okay, so with command, my, mm-hmm. my one-word command, uh, as I speak the word, the air around me verberates with the command, almost like... Skyrim shout is what I imagine it and it would just exemplify my voice towards this creature and he just hears halt as it almost echoes in the surrounding environment as you say your command word the creature is raising his fist up to strike Lopos you see him stutter for a second and the the bones start to clatter and clang and it almost seems like it's reverberating the spell back away from him and he continues his assault. Okay. Are you doing anything else, Klaus? Can I go back into the fog? Yes, you can move back into the okay. fog. Okay, I want to disengage back into the fog. You just move back into the fog and disengage. Yeah. All right. Next up is Tyrax. So I will come up behind him and take a couple of licks out of those tree trunks of legs he's got. You'll try right. to. Uh, whoa, whoa. I was, I, that was part of my plan. I didn't want him to stop because of a whole lot of damage. So this time, 
attacking in the same fashion. Mm -hmm. 22. 22 will hit. For the first one, and 22 for the second one. Both will hit. So how much damage for the first attack? 24 for the first one, 17 for the second. As you wail away, the bones that clamor up its legs, they start to break away. Little bits of shrapnel, they don't do any damage, but they sting, and little flecks of blood coating your fur. <laughs> As you, blood rain! As you bring back your axe, the bones start to cover the body up again, but before they do, you see very toned, very beautiful marbled flesh, then the bones would cover it back up. Anything else, Tyrex? No. Okay. Ragnar, it is your turn. All right, at the beginning of my turn, I like to drop my concentration on Fog Cloud because there's another spell I'm going to cast that's going to help my friends here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move up to here, and then I'm going to cast a spell at fifth level. I'm going to cast Spirit Guardians. Ooh, that's just a fun spell. Uh, you call four spirits protect you. They flirt, they they flirt, uh, flip around you in a 15 foot, uh, 15 foot to a distance of 15 feet for duration. If you are good or neutral, the spectral forms appear angelic, which they do, because I am chaotic up neutral. And then uh, basically an affected creature's uh, speed is half, which right now I'm just affecting the giant, but all my friends are unaffected that are inside the 15 foot duration. Uh, and then he has to make a saving throw, wisdom saving throw, uh, or suffer 3d8 uh, or that much damage at 40 to come casting at fifth level. Where are you putting the... I'm putting it like right here, because that way it, get, it protects um, Tyra, uh, and then also includes uh, Klaus because it's a 15 foot radius around. Yeah, that you got it right, right there. All right. He'll take that for all, you know, as when he you know, starts his turn in that area. Okay. So an angelic hoplite will appear before you, radiating energy away from it. And that's guardian spirit? Uh, spirit guardians, yes. A uh, spirit guardian, sorry. I apologize. He's only going to take the, the radiant damage, which is going to be the 19 when he starts his turn in there. And then basically all the, the little uh, creatures are going to have like a little electronic energy flows around this little 15 foot radius. So once it starts its turn, it makes a wisdom saving throw. If it fails, it takes damage. If it succeeds, it takes half. Correct. So yeah, you'll do that at the start of your turn. I just rolled the damage so you know what it would be. Okay. Low post. At the start of your turn, I need you to make me a constitution saving throw. 13. Uh, so 13 will fail. Is this poison? No, it's not poison. Are you sure? Because I have advantage on saving throws against poison. It's not poison. So any creature that starts its turn within 10 feet of the creature, there's an aura about it. So there's an aura of necrotic energy about it. As the creature walks up to you, this feeling of dread and loneliness hits you, and it starts to suck your life force away from it into the creature itself. You're going to take 12 points of damage. As you take the damage, you see some of the skeletons look up at you. They start to put out their hands as if trying to invite you in. Uh, what do you do? No, thank you. I am going to do what an adventurer does when fear goes charging at him. I'm going to roar angrily at the giant. Okay. And I am going to use my daunting roar. Uh, I need him to make a wisdom saving throw. And that is not a spell, right? That is just an ability. That is correct. Okay, wisdom saving throw. He rolled a nine. Well, what's the DC save? 13. So he is now frightened until the end of my next turn. Okay. And then I am going to uh, drop my long oh. bow. Yeah, he's not. Okay. Oh, he, he's uh, immune. He's, to, immune. To, he's to... immune. Yeah. You knew about his damage immunity. He's not his condition immunity. I know. I know. It's fine. I I, <laughs> I had a thing and I wanted to try it. Yep. But no, you're it... fine. You're fine. As you make that Lee and I roar, it definitely comes across this creature doesn't know what that is. It doesn't seem to permeate, doesn't seem to penetrate into him. He looks down at you curiously almost. He doesn't know he's supposed to be scared. He doesn't know he's supposed to be scared. Your turn. Go ahead. Continue. Does a 14 hit? Uh, 14 will miss. What about a 24? We'll hit. And that's going to be uh, six additional damage from Hunter's Mark. Uh, you only roll 1d6 because you only hit once. All right, so then that's going to be a four. Okay. So I do 10 damage. Yeah, you do 10 damage. As you step into him, some of the bones and some of the skeletons start to mold away from his body. You start to see very pristine, very beautiful marbled flesh underneath of it. Klaus and Tyrax, mm, those stone arms that are laying on the ground, you start to see them flex and move. He's going to go ahead, and at the start of his turn, he's going to make a Wisdom Saving Throw, correct? Correct. All right, Wisdom Saving Throw, and this is a spell, right? I rolled a 15. Uh, what's the DC? Uh, DC is 15, so you'll just take half. All right, you'll take half damage. So damage was 19, correct? Right. He'll take nine points of damage. That's Radiant Damage. Ooh, okay, Radiant Damage, very nice. He'll continue to wind up his fist. 
he'll punch straight down at you, Lopos. 24 to hit. Yeah, that'll hit. So you're going to take 15 points of bludgeoning damage and 15 points of necrotic damage. Tyrax, mm, as he punches down and down at Lopos, he's going to bring his foot up and swing and kick up at you. Uh, 24 to hit. Miss? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're going to take 17 points of bludgeoning damage. You are raging, so you take half of that, correct? Correct. So you're going to take 8 points of bludgeoning damage, but you're going to take the full 6 points of necrotic damage. I've known maidens who hit twice as hard. Okay. Klaus, it is your turn. You're within 10 feet of the creature. I need you to go ahead and make me a constitution saving throw. Klaus right. got 23. So the ability will not affect you for 24 hours. <laughs> You're completely immune to it. It's your turn, Klaus. Okay. I'm going up to the, the big thingy majigger, mm -hmm. and I'm going to use... I'm going to use a double-sided scimitar to attack okay. him. Double-bladed scimitar rolled a 17. 17 will hit. Okay, and then... So go ahead and roll for damage, and then add your branding spike to that. Okay, I rolled a 9 for damage, and then okay. do I just select the smite in the attack damage thingy? Yep, just select the smite. Go ahead, roll 3d6. 9. All right, 9 points. Now is that 9 extra points from the other 9? Yep, you've already hit it for 18. That's one attack, so go ahead and roll again. Now your branding smite has been burned, so you can't use that anymore. That's understandable. All right, right go so ahead. going back and uh, I rolled a 14 with the scimitar. 14 will miss. Okay. Well, I got oh. him at 18. That's still pretty good. Yep. Okay, Ragnar, it's your go. I'm going to cast a spell. I'm going to actually cast my spell at uh, third level. It's going to okay. be um, shatter, but I'm going to cast it over here to the left of the creature because I don't want to impact my friends because it's, it's within, it's 10 feet and each creature within 10 feet has to make a saving throw. So I'm just going to focus it over here so it doesn't hit my friends. But it's still Appreciate like that. What's the DC? DC is 15. Constitution saving throw? That shatter is, yes, constitution saving throw. 21. Okay, but you're still going to take half of this damage. Yep, go ahead. Roll for damage. You're going to take uh, half of 25 points of thunder damage. Perfect. So he's going to take half the damage. But even though he takes half the damage, the spell reverberates through his body. And the, the bones that crawl up around his body start to shudder and break apart. You start to see pieces of shale fall down from him, exposing more of that marbleized skin. The hands will start to flex and bend. And you start to see them shudder and lift themselves off the ground. Ragnar, go ahead and make me a constitution saving throw. I rolled a 15. So you failed that, so you're going to take 14 points of necrotic damage. Yeah, Lopos, it is your turn. I need you to make me a constitution saving throw as well. What'd you get, Lopos? A six. You know, the highest score possible. Gotcha. Uh, seven points of necrotic damage. Your turn. All right, if I could, I'm just going to roll my damage for my spirit guardians because it's still up. Uh, sure. Uh, sure. It's his turn next, so you can roll at the start of his turn. Oh, wait. Okay. Lopos? Is it possible for me to throw my sword at him? Yes. And how would I do damage for that? It'd just be a straight D6. Okay. Then I am going to throw my short sword at him. Okay. And then cast Barrage. All right. Uh, so he needs to do a dexterity uh, saving throw. Okay. 17. Actually, everyone in a 60-foot cone must succeed on a dexterity saving throw. So I need Tyrax, Un, Ragnar, and Klaus all to make dexterity saving throws. Okay, I do not succeed. I rolled a 10. All right, so that's going to be 13 damage to everyone who failed. Okay. Let's go six. Yes, yeah, so right. you got damage. 13 hit point of damage. Anything else you're doing there, Lopos? And then my Hunter's Mark damage. Okay, good roll. All right, so that is going to be... Uh, and did the, uh, did the giant save? Yes, the giant saved. So that would be seven damage? Yep. Six damage. Seven damage. All right. So that would be in total 15 damage. Yep. And that, that'll that end my turn. Okay. So he's going to make a wisdom saving throw against the radiant damage. Oh, he got a seven. So he takes full damage. He's going to take 22 points of radiant damage. He's definitely not looking good. He's The bones on his body start to fleck and shale away. The hands around him, they start to lift and hover off the ground. Two of them will fly towards him. They'll hang in midair over top of his head. As he turns to meet you, Klaus, and Tyraxon, he'll go down to punch at you. And when he does that, the stone hands will actually grab onto his fist and try to hold him back. So he's going to roll with disadvantage. Unfortunately, he still gets a 21 on you, Klaus. You're going to take 18 points of bludgeoning damage and 9 points of necrotic damage. Tyrax, mm, 24 even with disadvantage. 27 points of bludgeoning and 15 points of necrotic. Klaus, it is your turn. All right, where am I? I'm right next to this guy. 
He's not looking good, you said. That's right. So I want to imbue my double-sided scimitar with the magic weapon. Yeah, until this spell ends, which will be one minute, that weapon will become a magic weapon with a plus one bonus to attack rolls and damage rolls. So let me go ahead and attack with that. What would you roll? I rolled a nine, but that, I guess that would be a ten with the magic weapon. But All right, ten will miss. Yeah. You have one more attack? Yes, let me try it again. Well, that's a 13, which I believe that would still be a 14 with the magic weapon. And 14 will miss. Oh. All right, and that was my my bonus action, so that will be my three. Ragnar, it is your turn. Go ahead and make me a constitution saving throw before you start your turn. Okay. Uh, 22. 22. You are immune to the effect now. So my next thing I'm going to do is I have my friend here next to me. It looks like she's hurting a little bit. I'm going to cast Pure Wound on her. Okay. But a third level. All right. And I'm going to heal her for 17. So you got 17 health back there. Awesome. Okay. Wait, Wait you're giving out health and you didn't give me any? Well, yeah, you, have to be within, you have to be within range, and I can only do it as a touch spell. So she's right here next to me so I can touch her healer. And that's all I can do until his turn, and then I'll roll my damage again for the uh, Spirit Guardians. Let's go ahead and make me a constitution saving throw. 13. Low push, you will take seven points of necrotic damage. As you're just in this miasma, your life force keeps getting drawn into this creature. The skeletal hands reach, reach out, out a little bit further, trying to grasp you. All right, I'm hurting, and I've uh, either thrown or dropped all my weapons. So I am going to try and climb up the giant, okay. and I am trying to uh, claw his eyes out. All right, go ahead. Roll me an athletics check. I uh, critted. Uh, that's going to be a 26. So describe to me how you get up this giant. I uh, stick my claws from my paws, and I put my claws into him and just start climbing up his body until I get up into his face, and then I am going to try and slash his eyes out with my claw. Roll for attack. First one's going to be 11. Miss. And the second one's going to be 9. You very heroically get up there. As you're trying to slash at it, the skeletal body bits will start to reach out and grasp you and prevent you from clawing out of the creature's eyes. Well, I'm still going to remain perched up here. Yep. All right. So I need to make a wisdom saving throw. It is the giant's turn. He got a 21 with his advantage. I'll take half of 22. Okay. As he takes the damage, more of those bones and skeletons start to fleck away from his body. Two more hands from the valley start to twitch and move, and they fly out. Now there are four hands floating above him. His arms start to smooth out. The nick starts to drain away from his body. And you can see start to color starts to form in his skin. He's going to turn to you, Klaus, and he's going to bring down the hammer. Oh, boy. At disadvantage, 13. As he brings out his fist, the floating hands catch his fist right in front of your face and push him back. He stumbles a little bit. He goes up to grab at Lopos. With this advantage, you get a nine. He goes up to grab you at you, Lopos. The hands will grab his wrist and hold you from giving you harm. The hands seem to be fighting against his actual body. Klaus, it is your turn. Let me go ahead and use magic weapon one more time. Try that with Well, you, the... you have that. You have that spell. Like, oh, it's, it's just it's on. Active. Yeah, it's just on. Okay. So if you attack, you can make all three attacks. Do that, then. All right. Go ahead. All right. Uh, so what'd you roll, Klaus? Uh, Klaus rolled a critical 27. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm going to try to use... I'm going to use a smite with these, with these rolls. Okay, what level? Uh, third, please. <laughs> uh, third level, so that's 4d8. So, okay, and with criticals, so that's 8d8 points of damage plus 4d4 for your weapon. So go ahead and roll that damage. I rolled 31. So 31 points of radiant damage. So go ahead and break it down. So you rolled how much for the scimitar? She rolled 17. So 17, 17. points of damage. Mm-hmm. And how much uh, smite damage did you just do? 31. Klaus, please tell me how you kill this creature. Klaus will take his scimitar, and as he slices with all of his might into this creature, he calls out, By the power of Clothis, be gone! And slices into it. As you bring your scimitar into the giant, bright starlight erupts from your blade, burning away the nicks from the creature's body, burning away the skeletons that crawl across his skin. The creature falls to the ground. How quickly does he fall? Uh, normal speed? He's okay, because I'm oh, on yeah, his... Oh, yeah, you're on top of him. Make me an acrobatics check. That's going to be a 10. Yeah, you roll away. You're fine. Okie dokie. The creature falls down. White smoke rolls off the creature's body. The final two arms flex and move and shoot forward, 
attaching themselves to the creature's back. From the great ashen body, beautiful marbled skin glistens in the daylight. The arms start to flex. They place their hands onto the ground and start to push up. The giant that was covered in death and destruction now rises up. So the giant transforms into 100-handed ones. <sighs> His blank eyes turns to you, Klaus. Thank you. And that's where we'll end it tonight. Who is this multi-armed giant and how does he tie into the ordeal that the gods have set upon our champions? What is the fate of Aeolus? Why was he absent? And what will our heroes find in the Nyx? Tune in next week to find out these answers and more on Heroes of Theros Godfall. If you're enjoying the story so far, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the channel. And we'll see you next time here on Sunday Nights. Minstrels, play us out. Mm -hmm.